Let's pray, shall we, here? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I, I pray that as we come before you, that uh, we do adore you and your Son. My goodness, what has been done is, is beyond comprehension, for sure. And uh, you have been good, Lord, and you are long-suffering. You suffer for a long time, putting up with men and their sins, and that includes ours as well. But we thank you that you waited for us and you were patient with us, Lord. And you did whatever it takes to bring us to your son. Some of us with real tragedy. But thank you for the tragedy. Thank you for your goodness that leads us to repentance and the hope for the future. I pray that as we come together this morning also, we can remember that, Lord, there are 32 nations at war and conflict. Lord, I know that some of these are necessary, but but have mercy in the midst of your judgment and your justice, Lord. Thank you for being so good to us. Lord, I want to pray for the United States as well, our president. Lord, bring his heart to to see you, to repent, to know you. Same way with our Senate, Lord. Um, There are men and women who should be terrified of you, and they're old and getting ready to face eternity, and they're without you. Lord, bring in their hearts, bring your light to our, our nation as it grows darker. Lord, have mercy upon your people here as well. Keep our hands clean, Father, from the, the, this world and its system. But may we honor you in every way. We thank you for the privilege of gathering together and to hear your word, to, to see your son. Thank you for our time together. Open our hearts now to your word and your word to our hearts. In your name we pray. Amen. And amen. amen. Wonderful. The rest of us, we're going to be in John chapter 6. John chapter 6. Okay. Okay, the Gospel of John is the Gospel for Christians. There's a bunch of stuff in the Gospel of John that would have no applications at all to somebody who does not know the Lord. For example, what the Holy Spirit is doing inside of you and how He empowers you. You wouldn't be explaining that to somebody who doesn't know the Lord because it does them no no good to know such things, okay? And also, He just hits you right from the beginning. He just starts with the very first verses. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the one who became flesh is also God the Word. Okay, now he's pivoting off the Old Testament where we showed you that eight, about eight times in the Old Testament, the Holy of Holies is called the Word. Okay, and also Moses, who is the God-man, the Lord says twice in Exodus, I've appointed you as God to Pharaoh. He's the God-man. And he would have also been the Word of God because Aaron was made the Word because Moses didn't want the job. Very simple. And God, in frustration, just said, okay, well, Aaron will be your prophet. He will be the word of God. So Moses should have been the God-man who was the word of God. Okay? And now, as we come into chapter 6, he's going to walk us through the, through the tabernacle. He's been doing that. The word became flesh and tabernacle among us. He uses the word for the tabernacle in the Old Testament, right? And as he does that, he's going to walk us through the tabernacle furniture and the things that are in there. And so today, when Jesus claims to be the bread of life, those great big loaves, remember the big loaves that were in there? Twelve of them for the twelve nations, that God can feed a nation. That's the point of this, right? And it's called the bread of his face or the bread of his presence and of his approval. So long as he is their God, they shall not hunger, they will not thirst, uh, etc., and then other, by the way, there, there are two times that he, he provides bread. One is the bread in the wilderness, and Jesus will provide bread in the wilderness uh, today. And the other one is the omer of manna. Um, just think of quartz, that a little omer of manna, and they would go out every day and gather that. It was called manna because they didn't know what it was. And manna just means what is it, okay? What is it, okay? By the way, what would you do at Albertsons if you walked into Albertsons and said, uh, on what aisle is the what is it? <laughs> All right, it would be a strange thing to them, but that's literally what they called that. They didn't know what it was. Okay? And it's the perfect name uh, because how does Jesus take care of us and provide for us? Nobody knows, right? And he provides for you differently than he'll provide for me than, than, than somebody else. But, but he did that, and he took that. That's one day's ration, right? You go out and you get an omer every day. A man got one. That's his... That's his Meal for the day, it's his wife's meal for the day, and each child gets an omer, okay? He who gathered much, it said, had none left over. He who had gathered little had no lack, okay? Because manna could not be saved. Or what, did it do? what would it do? Turn to worms, right? It becomes vile and stench, right? The, that uh, your, your walk with Jesus Christ, and he's the bread of life. He's, the, he's going to explain, I'm the bread from heaven. That was a sign. Your fathers take that and they're dead, right? So that didn't do them any good. It was just bread. 
kind of thing. And it can keep your body alive for a while, but frankly, your body's going to check out of here one of these days anyway. But he's going to also explain that those things were signs. And what I'm teaching you, he says, the, the words that I'm saying to you, they're spirit and they're truth. So they're not about the physical. And he, so when he says, eat my flesh, and they get outraged. I said, That's, you, you should know better than this. Well, I'm, I'm, ta- I'm teaching you in, in ways you need to not be, be strange about this stuff. But that's him. But Moses was told to take one omer, one man's rations for one day, and put that inside the Holy of Holies in the Ark of the, the Covenant and where the blood of Christ is, where Jesus Christ sits uh, to the right hand of the Father, uh, etc., where the, the rod that budded the resurrection that did the miracles in the Old Testament. There it is. It's all there. Okay. And so that Jesus Christ is my personal provision for, for each day, right? And so when you pray, give us this day our every day the, the daily bread. What's the daily bread to a Jew? It's manna. You've got to go out and get it fresh every day. You've got to get up and walk with the Lord fresh every day. Don't, you know, don't coast on, on the past, okay? Uh, a lot of movements in Christianity are trying to re- recreate some event from church history. And you may be able to get away with it locally, depending on the situation, but they typically don't, don't work because life moves on. Life moves on, okay? Uh, so this is our context for our, our day. And also, it is, um, Jesus is not only training the apostles, because he's going to tell them, they've got this crowd, 5,000 men, plus women and children. Because remember, he's going to get the loaves and fishes from a child. But as he does this, he's training them, for their ministry in the future, he says, you guys give them to eat. You feed them. And they were taken aback and just, oh, okay. So let's just jump right in. We'll see this as we go. After these things, Jesus, who restores the meaning of his name, he went to the other side of the sea of the Galilee region, which is Tiberias. And a large numbered crowd was following him because they were observing the signs which he was doing upon the ones who were being sickly weak. Now, sickly weak, because the word means both of those kind of things. Now, notice there are signs. They point to something else. But Jesus, who restores, he went up to the mountain. He was sitting there with his student disciples. But the Passover, the hopping over, which is what it means, the feast of the Jews of praise was being near. Now, lifting up therefore the eyes, Jesus, who restores, also observed for himself that the large numbered crowd, it was coming toward him. He says to Philip, the friend of horses, lover of horses, friend of horses, from what source are we actually going to purchase breads in order that these might actually eat? It's going to be, a, um, it's actually a plural, breads, because he's not looking for loaves. They didn't have loaves like we have them. And even when the child has his loaves, they're, they're, they'd either be a little roll or a little flat slice of bread, okay? And he's got the fish, because they would take these little tiny fish, particularly for a school kid or something like that, and they would cook them in such a way they're very brittle, and you put it on one side of the bread, and just picture it like it's peanut butter, okay? And then you take your finger, and you just do that. And it goes across the, the bread, and now you've got your little sandwich, etc. And that's what they have, okay? Five loaves, little tiny lo- pieces, slices of bread, designed to feed a little, a little kid, okay? So it's not great big loaves of, of bread, all right? And he's saying this to test him because he's from, he's from Bethsaida. He's from this area. For he himself already knew what he was intending to do, okay? It's the same way with me and, and with you. God puts us all in situations where we don't have the resources for what we need to function, whether it's in ministry or, or, or in life, as, as we'll see here. So we don't know the exact location where this is, but it's on a hillside. He's not... He's out in the wilderness like Israel was and providing bread, doing what they did, right? Moses said, God is going to raise up uh, someone like unto me, a prophet like unto me, and he's going to do what I did, okay? So Jesus actually did that, right? When he, Moses, first of all, before he delivered anybody, he dealt with, remember the, the rod turning to a serpent? So Jesus goes in the wilderness and deals with the serpent, <laughs> deals with Satan out in the wilderness. He comes back, and the first guy he meets him, and Matthew is the leper because Moses put his hand inside his breast, which is where our leprosy comes from, inside of us. Okay? And he pulls it out, and it was leprous. He put it back, etc. So Jesus does just what he did. And now Moses fed him in the wilderness. Well, no, not Moses, but God. And he, Jesus is now doing that. Okay? And also, when he crosses the sea, he's moving backwards and forwards between locations with Herod Antipas and Herod Philip. So they're different governments as he's moving around here. Okay? Also, the Sea of Tiberias, 
the Sea of Gennesaret, the Sea of Galilee. These are all the same sea. A lot of names, right? Tiberias, because there was a city built over there in honor of the, um, uh, the Caesar. Okay? Now, the Sea of Galilee, I don't know if you know this or not, it's about 13 miles long. Not very, very long. Okay? About seven and a half miles wide. I was at a Redfish Lake one time, and I remember we were in canoes racing. Five-mile lake. And so it was quite a race going five miles over water with paddles. Okay? And I think my brother-in-law beat me by about five feet. <laughs> kind of thing. He and his wife, me and my wife, we were just... Anyway, so you could paddle this thing in a couple of hours. Okay? About 690 feet deep in the, in the deepest, deep, deepest part. Okay? Now... When we're going to also, after the feeding, there is the storm where Jesus walks on water. And the geography of that, that area with these hills, these mountains, with these canyons, create violent winds that come down through, the, and it can come up on them uh, pretty quickly. And these are trained fishermen. They're professional fishermen. They're not rod and reel guys. They're, they're, these are real, they're, they're real guys here. Okay? And so if they're scared of these storms, it tells you what kind of a storm there is. Okay? By the way, he mentions a, a Passover here. You know that the church used to believe that Jesus ministered for two years until so, somebody figured out in the Gospel of John there are three Passovers. So he's here at least three years ministering uh, dur during that time here. Okay, and so the Passover has 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 come here, and uh, it's all kinds of things are, are drawing near. And Jesus, this is the one Passover he's not in Jerusalem, which is strange because he's normally there. Okay. He lifts up his eyes. He sees this huge crowd coming through here. And um, he observes for himself. In the middle of the voice, he actually is learning information. He didn't know there was a crowd coming, but there they are. All right? Now, he addresses Philip, and here's the need, right? What are we going to do to feed this crowd? Okay? And he takes them out there. There's no way any little community in Israel could accommodate 5,000 men with women and children. Couldn't do that. Verse 7, Philip, who was a friend of horses, he answered him and said, 200 denarii is bread not sufficient for them in order that each one might actually have a little bit. Now, if you remember another story, Jesus talked about the denarii. A denarius is a coin that would be a day's wages. It was the way for a day of labor. So 200 days minimum wage worker type of a thing. And that's just not going to work out here. Okay. Now, one of the student disciples, Andrew the Manly, I think that's a great name, the brother of Simon Peter, which is listening Simon and Peter the Pebble. He's solid, but he can be kicked around a little bit. He says to him, there is a young boy here. It's a word for a very little child. And he's got five breads of barley and two fish. But what are these among so many? Okay. Barley was fed to animals and to the poor. It's considered the bread of poor. It tells you a little bit about this child and his family, that um, not a lot of resources. Okay? I remember one time I, I was translating in the Old Testament. I came across some barley, and I thought, that's a Hebrew word for hair, okay? because barley is a hairy crop. How's that for your Hebrew lesson for the morning? Anyway, and he's got two little fish. Okay? But what are these among so many? Okay? And Jesus, who restores, he said, you guys have those people recline. Not just sit, but they're reclining. And there was much grass in that place, and therefore the men reclined, and the number was around 5,000. All right? Now, breads, not loaves. That's, that is important. A child's lunch here, okay? Now, barley is the rougher, rougher food, etc. And they were going to have a leftovers when they're all said and done as well here, okay? He's going to take the bread in verse 11. And Jesus restores. He took the bread and he gave good grace. He's saying, so we even today we call it saying grace, right? And he gave good grace. He distributed to, the, to those who had reclined themselves and likewise out of the fish as much as they wanted. Okay, many of these people, if they're poor and there's a lot of bread and fish there, what do you think they're going to do? Just eat a happy meal? No, everybody was full until they didn't want any more. Okay? Didn't want any more. 
Now, but as they became filled, he says to the student disciples, they've been serving and they're hungry like everybody else. You guys gathered together the leftover fragments in order that nothing, there will be nothing that's actually lost. All right? So Jesus is not into trampling it on the ground or throwing it away. We need to be good stewards of this. Therefore, they gathered together and they filled 12 small baskets of fragments. I wonder who that's for. That's, you understand? When you get in ministry, let me tell you something. You eat last, you, you serve, and every, everybody else gets to go, and that's how that works, okay? That it's about serving everybody else, okay? And then when it's all said and done, there were 12 baskets full left for the, for the disciples, all right? Out of the five barley fish, which ones were left over from those who had eaten? And therefore, the people, having seen the sign which he had done, they were saying that this one, visibly true, He's the prophet. That's Moses, right? Moses, the second Moses. That one who's coming into the world. Got to be the guy. <laughs> Remember the woman at the well? She figured it out. And the Samaritans only used Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That's all they used. They didn't know where the temple goes or anything like that. So they could argue all that stuff because they didn't believe that stuff. But it says all of a sudden they came out from Samaria and, uh, and from that area of Samaria. The men came out talked with Jesus, he spent a couple of days with them, and they believed. No miracles, no signs, no nothing. Right after that, the Jews come, and he says, you guys don't believe anything unless you see miracles and signs, and kind of, there's a problem with, with the Jewish people, okay? Now, therefore, Jesus, who restores, perceiving that they're going to come and seize him. That's something. By force in order that he might actually make him king. And he went up again to enter the mountain by himself alone. I cannot imagine what happens. 5,000 men walking towards you. You're going to be king whether you like it or not. Okay? Why do they want him to be king? Bread. Fish. That's why. You're going to be in charge of this kind of a thing. Okay? By the way, being uh, heralded as a king in those days was not a good situation. Not good at all. Because you're going to be in direct competition with those who are kings, okay? All right. Now, the feeding of the 5,000 here, it's the only story that's in all four Gospels, the only miracle that's in all four Gospels, so it must be important, right? Everybody needs to know that this points to something. All right, now, whether it's 40 years in the wilderness or just on a mountainside, it does not matter. Whether it's millions in the wilderness, or 5,000 on the hillside, okay? The disciples told him in, in Matthew 14, send the people away, there's no food here, and they need to go, so lest they perish on the way, and those type of things. And Jesus told them, they don't need to go away, you guys feed them, right? You guys feed them. And this is what this, a lot of this is, is about. Let me tell you what ministry is, okay? I spend all week in the kitchen, in my Bible, and just putting together these sermons. And my goal is to get you the meal without messing it up or spilling it or dropping it or, or polluting it, right? And at that point in time, you need to, to be devouring the Word of God in its in simplicity and its truth because that's what brings you into contact with the, the true and living Lord, okay? They don't need to go away, okay? And then he says in verse 38, of, this is uh, of Mark, Mark 6, 30, how many loaves do you guys have? Go and see. So they go throughout these, <laughs> this crowd, okay? And they come back with the loaves and the fishes. Verse 44, he says, you guys give them something to eat. And the lesson is that Jesus will feed the multitudes through his servants. And he will deal with the, the societies, etc., cetera, through, through his people here. Now, this is important. Matthew 14, 18, they've gone through this with five loaves and two fishes, and Jesus says, bring it to me. I think that's key. What do you got? It's not what you don't got. What do you have? Bring it to me. Go set it before the Lord. Okay? Do you remember the story in the Old Testament? The army is surrounding Jerusalem and, and they're shouting and screaming profanities and blaspheming the true and living God. The king ends up with this note of their words and he just goes over to the temple and he just lays it down before the Lord. And he himself bows and said, Lord, here it is. Here's what they've said. And here's what they're doing. And the Lord said, don't, don't panic. Don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. And he did take care of it. Bring it to me. Okay? So they reclined them in groups of fifties and hundreds. 
okay? Not thousands. Nobody can serve thousands, but you can, you can serve fifties and hundreds, okay? Now, let me show you something. In Mark 8, after this event, it says, Now they've forgotten to take bread, and they were, had only one loaf with them in the boat. This is a different time here, okay? He cautioned them, saying, Watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod, and Matthew also includes the leaven of the, of the, of the Sadducees. The Pharisees were the tr ritual hypocrisy of tradition. Fakes. Pretend you're doing it on the outside, but you, it's not true of your heart, right? The Herodians, Herod, were a political movement. Beware of making politics. Everything, uh, Christianity is not politics, okay? You, we vote, we do those kind of things, but it's not our primary thing that we're about, okay? And the Sadducees were the wealthy liberals of the day, Okay? They were closer to God. They actually believed in those days that the more money you had, the closer you were to God. And so they were very wealthy because they controlled the temple. That's where they got their wealth. Okay? It says, They began discussing with one another the fact that they had taken no bread. Jesus, aware of this, he said to them, Why are you discussing the fact that you don't have any bread? Do you not perceive or understand in your hearts? Are they hardened? Having eyes do you not see? Having ears do you not hear? Do you not remember when I broke the five loaves and for the five thousand? How many small baskets full of broken pieces did you guys take up? They said, well, twelve. The seven of the, for the four thousand. How many baskets full, right, did you take, to take up? And they said the seven. Those were big baskets, by the way. The same word for the basket that Paul was let down over in a basket over the wall. Okay? And he said to them, do you guys not understand? He takes this application, and they're concerned about, about bread. I said, I'm not talking about bread. <laughs> I'm talking about leaven of movements and, and all these things, right? Because they're deadly to us. They're deadly to us. Okay? By the way, traditions, are, are traditions evil? No, they're, they're not. If you want a tradition, you can make one uh, for your family. We have traditions in my family, things that we do that nobody else does, and uh, it's really nobody else's business, uh, that, that sort of thing. But we do them. Uh, some years we don't do them, other years we, <laughs> we do. It's not a problem until you make it binding. Thus says God Almighty, keep my tradition. Right? Can I think that's, that's wrong, okay? And then he says, Matthew 16, 11, how is it you don't understand that I'm not speaking concerning bread, but beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, you'll notice something here. This, this earthly provisions for multitudes of people is not a big deal. Okay, he says, you guys have seen this. How is it you, you haven't even learned it, that God will take care of you? That, what's going on here? Is your heart hard? Your eyes are blind? You can't see? Then they understood. He did not say, beware of the leaven of bread but of the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. That's the point here, okay? There's plenty of leftovers. God is going to take care of me. He's going to take care of you. He'll take care of me. He will take care of you. Okay. This has got to be the prophet who's going to come into the world, right? He perceived, by the way, he didn't have the information, but he, he learned by looking at what was going on. They're going to take me by force, make me a king here, <clears throat> so it's time for me to leave. All right, so he leaves and instructs the disciples to go across the sea. As the evening came, the student disciples had gone down upon the sea, and they got into a boat, and they were going across the sea to Capernaum, the city of Nahum. As it had already become dark, and Jesus who restores, he had not yet come to them so that the sea, by a strong wind blowing, was rising up. Okay? You know, they found one of these fishing boats on the Sea of, of, of Galilee. It carried a single mast, about 26 and a half feet long, 7 and a half feet wide, okay? and it rode low when it was in the, in the water. And it would, uh, a fishing crew would be about five men, plus their cargo, their things that they worked with, that are there. So Jesus and all these, all these men in there, that's a pretty good weight. They'd be riding low. All right? So this is a big issue if you have a storm coming up. Okay? Therefore, verse 19, they had begun rowing about 25 or 30 stadia. That's three to four miles. Okay? By the way, um, when you have Bible translations, it's worth having several translations because some of them will use stadia and some of them will modernize it and get it put in miles, okay? 
But these measurements are going to play out in other passages, and if you can't see the measurements, you can't figure them out, okay? So that's, uh, remember the city of New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven and all that stuff? It's got foundations. And if it's in English, you can't see the mileage. You can't see what it, uh, is in there. So, But it's in stadia. And when you start adding up one side, you come up with 144,000. You need to know who that is, right? You, they're, they're talking about people, things like that. Kind of thing. So you can't see that if it's in miles, but you can see it if it's, if it's, if it's there. Okay? There are three or four miles. They were observing Jesus who restores, and he's walking upon the sea. And he was getting near to the boat, and they were caused to be frightened. You know, if you're not in the middle of the ocean and somebody comes walking up to your boat, <laughs> you know, think, it make you a little nervous. And that's what they're seeing. They scream. Because ah! they were convinced it's a ghost. And it's not Casper. Okay. And again, we have another sign here as he walks on the water. Okay. Jesus rebukes the Jewish people and he rebukes his own disciples. When I'm doing things that only God, in the Bible actually says only God can do this, what should be your conclusion? You get the idea here. Okay. He says to them, it is I am. You guys, do not be frightening yourselves. Middle voice. You're doing this to yourself. Stop this. Okay? Others can translate it. It is I. And I'll show you why, why I think I prefer the first one here. He's going to do it this way, right? And he's going to calm the sea in just a moment here. Okay? Job 9.8. God alone walks on the waves of the sea. Who does it? Only God. Peter did so by permission of God. Okay? Only God walks on water. Okay? Psalm 77, 19. Your road is through the sea. Your path is through the great waters. Your footprints are not known. Okay? That, that's the reason you can't always follow what God is doing because uh, do you leave footprints in, if you're walking on water? No, you don't leave any footprints. You don't see any. But the point being here, who walks on water? God alone walks on water. Okay? And then when he, they cry out, and Jesus uses the word I am. Of course, you know I am is God's name in the Old Testament. When he explains that, he tells Moses, I am, I am. I am is my name. And then he says, the one who is, we translate Yahweh. Yahweh, that's my name. And then he says, I am who I am. That's my name too. So he gives him three names because they all pretty much mean the same, same thing. Okay. Now, when you see the word I am, the question is, I am what? Right? When standing alone, Jesus uses this as in John 8, 58. He said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And his enemies took that very clearly. He's claiming to be Yahweh. Now, normally you, you have something that follows this, I am something. Okay, You could call that predicate nominatives, where it restates the, the subject. But... 635, I am the bread of life. Okay, so I am this. I am the light of the world. Uh, that's what I am. I am the door, right? Etc. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. So the he, I, that makes good sense, right? So when he uses the word I am and it doesn't, isn't followed by anything, then it stands alone, like when he said before Abraham was I am. I think he's clearly using that. And he's actually using it also for, for these things, okay? So I am, and by the way, do you remember in Revelation he says, I am is Alpha and Omega. Remember that? The beginning and the end, okay? Now notice what he just said. I deal with things that start and things that finish, things that have a beginning and things, you know, that's a project, right? So it's not like I am nothing, okay? Things begin with me and things end with me, okay? And then when he uses the letter of the alphabet, I am A and I am Z. I am the A through Z and everything else also in between. No word, no story is written without me. I'm, I am everything. So when Colossians and Philippians said he's our play Roma, he's our fullness, he's my everything, absolutely my everything. That's very, very true. Jesus said, without me, you can do you're done, right? I, living in you, you obey me by faith, and then you can trust me. I'll take care of you. If your heart's right with me, I'll take care of everything. So, all of these read, I am something, but when it's lacking a predicate nominative or that following what he is, it stands alone, more like a declaration. For example, 
when Jesus says, I am, and he does something that nobody else can do except the I am, like walking on water, which the Bible says only God can do, right? Men don't walk on water. Men can't calm storms. God can calm them. He decrees them. Okay? And in Matthew, when he first did this event, it says that Jesus approached the boat. They thought he was a ghost, and they cried out from fear. He says, take courage. It is I am. See it? Now, this is key. I mean, I came across this almost 20 years ago, and I was translating, and I thought, it is I am. Okay, he doesn't say I'm something, it's just, it's just I am. And Peter says, Esue, if you are. You see it? If you are. If that's who you are, then tell me to come out there. Okay? And the real clincher for that, they come, Jesus grabs Peter, says, Why did you doubt? and pulls him out of the ground, out of the, out of the water. They come over to the boat, and this is the first time in the New Testament the apostles, the disciples, worship him. They never worshiped him before. What are they doing? Why are they worshiping him? Who do they think he is? They think he's God. Okay? He is God. Okay? If you are, if you're what? If you're what you just said you're the I am, if, if that's you, right? So I think that's the better, better rendering. I wouldn't go, go to the wall with other, other men over that, okay? And the first time they worship it. You know, in, in the 100s, actually, it could be in the, the AD 90s, up into the AD 100s, the Jews translated the uh, Old and New Testament into Syriac. It's called the Peshitta. So I thought, I wonder. And Jesus says, take courage. This is the Jews translating th this. And he uses the word I, I. That's all, this, all it says. Okay? Some of you are, are, don't know this, but the word am and is, things like that, are constantly inserted in the New Testament because they're not used, right? They are, they're used interche interchangeably with nothing. It's just implied. So this could, I would, I would say, I, I would be I am, I am. So it makes good sense. I think that's how they uh, may have understood it. Okay? Isaiah 9, 6. This is from the, the Targums. The Targums were the Aramaic translation. When they came out of Babylon, they were no longer speaking Hebrew. They were speaking Aramaic. Okay? And in Nehemiah, it says, when they stood up to read the scriptures, all the people uh, gathered there. And it says they targumized or translated. Targum means is the Aramaic word for translation. So they targumized or translated to give the people the understanding. And it says the people humbled themselves and repented because they understood. They understood it. Okay? Now, Watch this. This is the Targums, Isaiah 9, 6, in their Targum, that the coming Messiah will be the mighty God, and he will be Messiah. He's the mighty God. He is Messiah. Okay? Job 26, 12, by his power, he stills the sea. Okay? You ever tried to still the stormy sea? Huh? How well does it go for you? Because you're not God. You can't do it. He can do it. Okay? Psalm 89, you rule and still the raging sea. So Jesus is doing these miracles, these signs, and he, they're signs to, to tell you who he is, but they're also signs about, about what, your future and, and the life you're going to live. You're going to go through stormy trials. You are. You're not going to get out of them, but you are going to go through them. But you're going to be okay. All right? You rule over these things, King. Okay? And again, they are seeing these things be done. Only God can do these things. So he says, it is I am, verse 21. Therefore, they were wanting to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat was on the land. They shouldn't have been anywhere near land, but it was there to which they were going. On the next day, the crowd that had stood across the sea, they saw the small boat. Another was not there except that one. And that Jesus, who restores, he had not entered the student with his student disciples into the boat, but his student disciples, they had gone away alone. Other boats came out from Tiberias. This is from the, the town there. And um, they came near the place where they had eaten the bread, and the boss Lord had been given a thanks of good grace. Therefore, that crowd saw Jesus who restored. He's not there. And neither his student disciples, they themselves embarked into the small boats and they went to Capernaum, the city of Nam, where they were seeking Jesus who restores. We still need a king, <laughs> okay? They found him across the sea and they said, Rabbi, my, our great one, this is what that rabbi means, 
When did you arrive here? What's going on here? Now notice, they saw the boat that was there, and he didn't go with them. Jesus, who restores, verse 26, he answered them. He said, truly, amen, truly, amen. And again, I've shared with you before, truly, truly, verily, verily, amen, amen. These things are um, all very similar, but the word amen itself is a really um, a binding term, and it's used for the blessings and the cursings and agreements of covenants, and it's used to swear oaths, things like that. So when Jesus is saying amen, I think he's saying, yeah, get this, because this is the way this will play out. Here's reality. You need to embrace this. I'm saying to you guys, you're seeking me not because you guys saw the signs. What do they think about the miracles and the signs? Ah, who cares? <laughs> Dinner. My goodness. But rather because you ate from the bread and you guys were foddered. Interesting term for feeding animals. I threw you some bales of hay. That's all you wanted was bales of hay because you're, like, you're acting like a horse or a donkey. This is all you want. You guys do not work for the eating that which is perishing of itself. How much earthly food perishes? All of it. It'll perish with the eating or in those days, bread was baked daily because they didn't have any plastic bags to put it in and they didn't have any refrigeration or anything like that. So you make a loaf of bread, it was consumed in that day because the next day it's going to be crusty and hard. Okay? But rather than bread that perishes, bread is food. It can, a sheep can be bread. Okay? Anything can be bread. Okay? But rather eating that which is remaining to life eternal. There's a food out there that will sustain you and it will never go, go away. You don't have to bake it every day. You don't have to do anything, that thing. Which the Son of Man, there's a term for the Messiah, is going to give to you guys. For the Father, this watching God, he has sealed this one. All right? By the way, you'll notice this. He switched to a future tense. I'm going to give it to you. What I just gave you is not why I'm here. That's a sign, a miracle, like Moses, pointing out to something I'm going to give to you. I'm going to give you something that will sustain you forever. Okay? Earthly food, that's a sign. It points to something. A temporary sign, miracles, right? And him, it says, the God has sealed or has stamped him. With a signet ring is, you know what a signet ring is? People did not used to sign things. They used to put a stamp on it, their, their, uh, their rings. The word signet means sign. Yeah, right? Then, by the way, you know they found, found Pontius Pilate's signet ring? Okay. Jeremiah's secretary was Baruch. They found his signet ring. Etc. They found Jezebel has a signet ring. And I thought, why in the world does she have a signet ring? She wasn't king. Or was she? You get the idea here? So they take this stamp, put it in there. In the book of Haggai, in the end, when all the nations and <clears throat> armies are overthrown, he talked to the Zerubbabel, and his name means see, uh, the seed from Babylon, the seed of Babel, okay, from, from there. On that day, Yahweh says, I'm going to appoint you as the signet ring. You are the ring. Okay? Because I've chosen you, says Yahweh of hosts. Now notice, the Messiah is coming. When he gets here, he is the signet ring of God. Whatever he says has the stamp of God on it. And that's the, the picture that we, we have here. Okay? He's not going to wear it. He will be the, the ring, the Messiah him, himself. Okay? Now, you can't believe what they're about to do here. Verse 28. Therefore, they said to him, what are you going to actually be doing in order that we might actually be working the works of the watching God? And Jesus, who restores, he answered and he said to them, this is the work of the watching God. You want to, I want to do the works of God, that you guys might actually believe in the one he sent. You want a job? There's your job. Believe me. Therefore, they said to him, well, what sign, therefore, what do they, what do they think about signs? They really don't care, do they? Okay. What sign, therefore, are you doing in order that we might actually see it and we might actually believe in you? What, he had, what did he just do? He came up with bread for thousands of people, and they asked him for a sign. Our fathers, they ate manna in the wilderness. Okay. Even as it is written, bread out of heaven he gave them to eat. Therefore, Jesus, who he said to them, truly, amen, truly, amen, get this down. 
It's binding on you. I'm saying to you guys, Moses was drawn out, his name. He did not begin to give you bread in, in, uh, bread to you guys. It's a perfect tense. It means something begins with continue action. But rather, my father is giving, notice present tense, my father's giving you guys the evidently true bread out of heaven. And you don't understand what's right in front of you. I'm the one who you must feast on and live forever. For the bread of the watching God is the one who's descending out of heaven. You want bread? That's be me. I'm descending out, out, of, out of heaven. And also is giving life to the world. Therefore they said to him, Lord boss, give us this bread all the time. All the time. And again, do a sign. He just did it. Well, do a sign, make bread. I just did that. Those of you who have been in a classroom teaching students, have you ever had somebody ask a question and in disbelief you look at them and say, I just answered that. Okay? Which means that person is not paying attention. Okay? Just like the disciples did not pay attention. Oh, he's mad about bread. I don't mean bread. I'm talking, who's talking about bread? Don't you remember the bread? I, Jesus who restores, he said to them, I am the bread of life. The one who's coming to me, there's no way he's actually going to hunger. And the one believing in me, there's no way he's actually going to thirst. Because in the New Testament, Jesus will be inside of you and he's the bread, right? It never goes away. It never loses its power. The water's inside of you. It never goes away. It never loses its power. And he's not talking about earthly things. You're still going to die here. Physically, because physical bread perishes, etc. But he's, he is eternal. This is really important. Okay, Three times in this passage, he's going to use what's called a double negative. Okay? A double ne negative means it's not possible. It's the same double negative he used in Matthew 28. I will never leave you nor forsake you. It's not possible that that would happen here. It's not possible that with spiritual things, Things in your mind, which you just think with, you think with your spirit, things in your mind, things like that, you can plug into God and find joy and refreshment in, in heavenly things and eternal things. These are not earthly things. You may still struggle with physical struggles, okay? As many of us do. Many of us do. What comes through your mind when you see a, a guy who claims to have all these healing powers and he wears glasses? Why is he wearing glasses? He's got earpieces. Why has he got earpiece? Understand, right? He's got a personal doctor. What need does he need of a personal doctor? Right? I would love to have the tally of how many, how many of the healing churches were closed down because of COVID. Many did. Many did. Right? There's no way. This is the reason why your world can be falling apart here. Okay. And there's a time, you know, I'm aware at my age that my time is going to end soon. I'm aware of that, okay? And as I get closer to that, my health fails. My wife's health is failing. Uh, th those things are, are very real. But, but I understand that's not eternal life. That's not that stuff. The body will be raised from the dead very soon. But right now, I need to focus on, on the Lord and plug into uh, my, my joy and my reality are there. That's where they're there. That they're at, okay? And that can't be taken from me. It can't be taken from you. They can, this body they may kill. God's truth abideth still. Okay? Because the mighty fortress is our God. Verse 36. But I said to you guys, you guys began to stare at me. And you guys did not believe. Now notice he just told them something. When he started doing miracles and making bread, what were they doing? Staring. That's the word. They, they Watching him do this, they're watching a miracle right in front of them, right there. You began to stare at me, and you didn't believe. All you saw was other things. Each one that the Father is giving to me, he is going to come to me. Okay, now notice, he is going, and that's the rendering. He is going to come. And how, how does he know that he's going to come? Because the Father has given him to me. And the one who's coming to me, here's a double negative again, there's no way, it is not possible that I would actually cast him out to the outside. When you come to Christ, there's no way he's going to reject you. If you come on his terms, 
It always is his terms. Because I came down from heaven not in order that I might actually do my own desire, but rather the de- desire of the one who sent me. The word for desire, I, to want and to will, same, same Greek word. Okay? God's will is what he wants. That's all that is. Verse 39. But this, this is the desire of the one who sent me, that each one whom he gave me, past tense, I will not actually lose, but rather I will actually raise him up. Raise up is a word for verbal form of resurrection. In the last day, for this is the desire of my father, that each one who is observing the son, observing, watching him, who is also a believer in him, and that's the construction there. If you're observing him and believing, he's actually having, he has it now. He has eternal life, life eternal. He's secure. And I, I am going to raise him up, resurrect him in the last day. Then the physicals will, will matter at that point in time. Our, our bodies, will, our physical bodies will be spiritual bodies in the sense they will respond to our spirit. Yes. By the way, how, when you're exhausted in the morning, how well does your body respond to your spirit? Okay. Therefore, the Jews of praise were grumbling concerning him because he said, I am the bread of life that comes down out of heaven. They were saying, this one, is, is he not Jesus, the son of Joseph, which means the addition? in whom we, we've, we've known his father and his mother. How is he now saying, I came down out of heaven? What, do they assume the Messiah wouldn't have a father and mother? Jesus who restores, he answered, he said to them, you guys don't be grumbling with one another. Not one person is able to come to me unless the father, the one who sent me, he actually drags him. Ever seen your kids dragging things? They never know why. Somebody said, he, he's... You're dragging a tomato there across the string on across your kitchen floor, and you have, why are you doing that? Uh, I don't know. He doesn't know, but he but he drags him. How do you get to Christ? God drags you. Same word for when Peter grabbed the net full of fish towards the end and grabbed them in, and he was shocked that the net was not torn because he had drug it up on the up on the beach. And I also I'm going to raise him up in the last day. It is having been written by the but in the prophets. They're all going to be ones who are taught by the watching God. Okay? I notice God is dragging them to the Son of God and teaching them. Each one who has heard from the Father, who is also the one who has learned, he is coming to me. So we don't come to Jesus knowing nothing. Now that anyone did see the Father, not that anybody did see the Father, except the one who is from the watching God, this one, he has seen the Father. Truly, amen, truly, amen. I'm telling you this, you've got to grab this. I'm saying to you guys that the one who's believing, he has life eternal. Let me ask you something. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, God of very God, that he died for your sins, that he rose again on the third day, and God has brought to you to, to look at him and say, and say, I need you? Then do you have eternal life or not? You do. Okay. Those with another gospel that Jesus never preached and views that he never did, who call upon him are calling upon a myth. 48, I am the bread of life. Your fathers in the wilderness, they ate manna and they died. This is, it is a true bread. It is the bread, the one descending out of heaven in order that whoever actually eats from it, he actually has stopped dying. And that's the word there. It, his death has stopped. I've intervened in this. Okay? Now notice, you actually see God. You actually believe who he is. You actually know what this means. I am the living bread, the one that came down out of heaven. If a person actually eats from this bread, he's going to live into eternity. And that bread which I I am going to give, it is my flesh on behalf of the life of the world. Now this would have been a horrendous thing because in the Old Testament they couldn't even eat the the flesh of an animal with its blood uh, in it. Okay. But remember this, there's a, Leviticus 17, 11 says the life is in the blood. That's what most translations say, but it's, it's nephesh, the soul is in the blood. So when it says Jesus poured out his blood, another passage may say he poured out his soul. Uh, you can see it in, in the blood. Therefore, the Jews of praise were disputing among themselves because he's saying, this is, how, how is one able to give his flesh to us to eat? Therefore, Jesus who restores, he said to them, truly, amen. Truly, amen. I'm saying to you guys, unless you actually do eat the flesh of the Son of Man. You guys actually drink His blood. You guys don't have life in yourselves. Again, if you don't do this, there's no life for you. 
The one who is eating my flesh, who is also drinking my blood, he has life eternal, and I, I am going to raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is evident true food, and my blood is evident true drink. The one who is eating my flesh, who is also drinking my blood, he is remaining in me, and I am also in him. You will be there in me forever, and I will be in you forever. Okay? Even as the living Father, he sent me. I also live on account of the Father. And the one who is feeding on me, that one also, he is going to live on account of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not according to your fathers. They, they died. The one who is feeding on this bread is going to live into eternity. These things Jesus who restored, he said in a synagogue gathering in Capernaum, the city of Nahum. Therefore, many of the student disciples, many, there is disciples, right? Many student disciples, having heard this, they said, this is a hard word, who's able to hear it? But Jesus who restores, he came to know in himself that his student disciples were grumbling concerning this. And he said to them, this is tripping you guys? Therefore, if you guys actually watch the Son of Man ascending up where he was before, Resurrection and life and the spirit, that is the one who is the life giver. The flesh is not profiting. There's no physical advantage. <clears throat> not one thing. The specific statements which I said to you guys, it is the, their spirit, it's, it's spirit and it's life. So he just told them, I'm not talking about physical thing. Don't come up here and bite my arm. But there are among you those ones who are not believing. For Jesus, who restores, he had known from the beginning which ones are not the believers and who it is who will give him over. And he said, on account of this, I said to you guys that not one person is able to come to me unless it is actually given to him from my father. From this, many of the disciples, his student disciples, they went away to the things behind, things that they had left. And they were no longer walking with him. Therefore, Jesus who restores, he said to the twelve, you guys, you guys are not going back? A lot of these disciples aren't disciples, are they? They think they are, but they're not. Simon who hears Peter the pebble, he answered, Lord boss, who are we going to go away to? The specific words of life eternal, you have them. And we, we have come to believe and we have come to know you. You are the Holy One, the watching God. Let me tell you about that word Holy One. It's interesting. Literally, it just says you are the Holy. Okay? Over and over again in the Old Testament, you read that word standing alone. And usually you have to fill in the blank okay, if, you, if you think there's a blank there. So all through the Psalms, it says he's the Holy, the Holy, the Holy. And they say the Holy Sanctuary, the Holy Temple, uh, the Holy Priest or something. They're, they're adding those words. Okay, but just as it stands, you are the holy. That's what he just said. Is that what they meant back there? I think so. And I think I can go every one of those kind of things. Let me tell you the difference is. Do you know what the difference is? The difference is a dot. And the dots and squigglies in the Hebrew text aren't Hebrew. They can't, came, uh, they were added A.D. 1100. How's that? Okay, you know what they are? I can put a dot over here and make it a participle, the one who... One, a jogger, right? Uh, a jogger, a runner, a skipper. That makes it a participle. I can move it over a letter and make it an infinitive. To run, to jump, to cry, to, to whatever. And it's all those dots, and all those dots are interpretation. I'm going to pull them out and add what right there. So when I would translate the Psalms, I just go, the Holy One. And it fits the context every time. Verse 70, Jesus who restores, he answered them, Did I not choose twelve for myself? And from among you guys, one, he is a slandering devil, which is what devil means. And he was speaking about Judas of praise, the son of Simon who hears Iscariot, the man from Carioth, for this one being one of the twelve, he was about to give him over. My goodness, yeah. Storms, not a problem. Can God take care of you in the wilderness? Not a problem. He can't deal with unbelief. That's a problem. Okay? It doesn't mean you're out. It just means that you, you have to, to grow and to come to know him. Come to know him. Father, thank you for our time. Thank you, Lord, our Father, for showing us your son on earth 
who tells us these are signs pointing to something. And he's going to give us life, and now he is giving us life. And we have that now. The one who believes, we've observed him enough to know who he actually is, and we've called upon his magnificent name. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved or made whole. We thank you for him. He's our life, he's our bread, our water, our milk and meat. He's the clothing we wear on the inside. And he's our breath. Messiah is our breath, Jeremiah said. You are Lord Jesus, you are everything. You are at the right hand of the Father on the throne with him. Thank you for our life. And Lord, help us not lose perspective in this world when this world takes things from us. And it takes our health. And it takes things away from us. And we, uh, some of us, even at a young age, are called to you and called to come home to eternity. And we await the resurrection when you return and raise our physical bodies. And there will be fullness of joy, incredibly. And there already is in some ways, Lord, as we look to you and realize our joy is in heavenly places. And our life is in heavens as well. We love you. May our time of dining together in fellowship be pleasing. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.